let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we are again asking for your grace as we proceed in worshiping you tonight. Lord, tonight we will be focusing on your grace. And Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church to have big thoughts of you and great thoughts of the grace that you have given to us. Lord, the most important thing about a person is what they think of you. And we ask that you change how we think about you tonight. We pray this in your gracious name. Amen. One of the greatest critiques that Martin Luther had during the Reformation was the following. Martin Luther, if you are claiming that a person is saved by the grace of God alone, will that not lead to debauchery? Will that not lead to people living lawless lives? Because if grace saves you, what is the motivation for doing good works? Martin Luther's response was simply this. John 14 verse 21, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you would keep my commandments. That was the motivation for the good works that would be exercised by believers. Not out of compulsion so as to please a taskmaster, but out of love and devotion so as to show love towards a God who showed great love towards us. That is one of the great truths of the Reformation. According to the Scriptures alone, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Last week we started with these solas that the Reformers are known for. Specifically, we introduced it by way of John Calvin. and We looked at sola scriptura. Tonight we will look at sola gratia, grace alone. If you were to walk up to a Catholic, if you were to walk up to a Muslim, if you were to walk up to any of your mainstream cults, think the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and you ask them this question, are we saved by grace? Every single one of them would say yes. Every single one of them would say yes. But as soon as you add one small word to that phrase, are we saved by grace alone? They would say no. That one small word is what separates all of the world with what the Bible teaches. And so having looked at what the Bible says about Scripture, let's spend this evening looking at what the Bible says about grace. And so right off the bat, when we hear that word grace, there are two things that should come to mind. The first thing is that God is good. The second is that we are not. God is good and that we are not. William Tyndale, the great Bible translator, wrote the following concerning God's grace. He says, by grace, that is to say by God's favor, we are plucked out of Adam and ground, the ground of all evil and we are grafted into Christ, the root of all goodness. In Christ God loved us, the elect and chosen, before the world began. And He reserved us unto the knowledge of His Son and of His Holy Gospel. And when the Gospel is preached to us, it opens our hearts and gives us grace to believe and puts the Spirit of Christ in us. And we know, him as our, we know God now as our Father, the most merciful and consent to His law in love, the love of our hearts with a desire to fulfill it. The blood of Christ obtained all things that is good of God for us. What a great quote. So if we were to define grace, if we were to capture the essence of this word, the, the church, the world loves that word grace, but how can we define it? Well, simply this. Grace is God's sovereign, unmerited favor, undeserved goodness that He gives to those who only deserve His wrath and His punishment. 
God graces God's sovereign and unmerited favor, undeserved goodness that He gives to those who deserve His wrath and His punishment. And so this evening, I want us to focus on three simple study points. The first one being, what do we deserve? What do we deserve? Well, to answer that question, like we studied this morning, we need to understand the true condition of man. Is man basically good or is man basically bad? And so, instead of asking you your opinion, and I'm sure you are not here to hear my opinion, let's page through our Bibles and look at a few passages. And let's start in the beginning. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. This is God speaking, or it's about the Lord speaking. Genesis 6 verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of his thoughts and the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9. Remember we read that passage this morning as well. 17 verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Let's maybe go to the New Testament. Let's go to Luke chapter 18. Luke 18 verse 18 reads the following. And a ruler asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? Only God alone is good. Maybe let's go to one of the most famous passages on this topic. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes concerning the natural condition of man. Romans chapter 3, and let's start in verse 9. What then? Are Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we, are all, we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouths is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we read passages like this, and the first objection we often hear is simply this. But there are people who do good things. There are people who give to charity. There are people who care for the poor and the destitute. There are people who who are very loving. Well, this takes us back basically to what the Bible teaches concerning the doctrine of total depravity. You've probably heard that term, right? Total depravity. Now, what total depravity teaches us, what these verses teach us, is not that you are as sinful as you could be, but that you have the potential to be the greatest sinner within your own heart. That every faculty of your existence, all elements of your being, your emotions, your will, your desires, are all tainted by sin. All of it. There is no part of your being that is free of sin. And because of this, even the good works that you do are tainted by sin. That is why Isaiah writes and says, Even our good works are like filthy rags before God. Because even our greatest works are tainted by sin and selfishness. That is what these verses teach us. Jeremiah, to read a few other passages, if we were to ask the question, are we able to choose to do good if we want to do it? Jeremiah 13, verse 23 reads as follows. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then also you can do good. Then also you can do good who are accustomed to evil. 
God is asking these rhetorical questions. Can the leopard change his spots? Can he change one spot and move it there? Or change his spots from spots to stripes? Can you change the color of your skin? Influence the amount of melanin in your body and change your skin from one color to another? No? Is that not possible? Then God says, how can you do good who are accustomed to evil? This is our natural state. This is who we are by default. Now listen, friends, I know this might be uncomfortable to many. Maybe not those of you who are sitting here, but definitely someone who will be watching online. At the end of the day, you need to understand that what have I been doing up until now? I've simply read from the Bible. I've simply read passages of what God says about us. And so taking all of this into mind, yes, you are not the greatest murderer, you are not a rapist, but you have the potential to be if God removes His restraining grace. Where does this then leave us? What do we deserve? Romans 6 verse 23, for the wages, the payment, the salary of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. The salary of sin is death. And also Ephesians 2 verse 3. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. That is who we are by nature. That is who we are by default. And so if we read these passages... From Genesis, through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, we come to the conclusion that there is nothing within us intrinsically that makes any of us worth saving. Because we have rebelled against our Creator. We have chosen literally everything except for Him. There is nothing we can do to even save ourselves because even our greatest works fall short of God's glory and are seen as nothing but filthy clothes before God. Think of the greatest thing you have done in your life. That one thing that you are most proud of. The amount of money you maybe gave someone. The amount of food you delivered somewhere. The amount of encouragement you've given to people. Apart from Christ, to God, that's nothing but a basket full of dirty clothes and laundry. But what about the good news? Why is it then that the Christian church can claim to have such a thing as a gospel? Well, that then takes us to our second study point. What does God give? We, we recognize now from God's word who we are by nature. But now let's ask this question. What does God then give us? Well, to understand, to understand this question, we need to understand what the nature of God is. And Exodus 34 verse 6 is one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. Exodus 34 verse 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed... The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Grace as we read in that passage, is part of who God is. He is the God who is gracious, the God who is merciful, the God who is slow to anger. That is where our understanding of grace needs to be rooted in. That is where it starts, in the very nature of God. And so I know many people use the words mercy and grace interchangeable, but they are not. Mercy and grace are two separate terms. And if we were to define each of them, we could say the following. 
Mercy is when God does not give us what we deserve. Mercy is when God does not give us what we deserve. Because what do we deserve? Judgment. Wrath. Justice. For breaking the highest of laws and going against the greatest of natures, our God. Mercy is God giving us what we do not, is God not giving us what we deserve. Grace is when God gives us something we can never deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. Grace is God giving us what we will never or could never deserve. And what is this that He gives us? Well, friends, think about the following. God could have simply done the following with you. He could have simply said, you deserve justice, wrath, poured out upon you for violating God's laws, but I won't send you to hell. That's it. I won't give you what you deserve. You don't have to go to hell. But is that where God stops? He gives us grace. He gives us what we can never deserve. Instead of just not sending us to hell, He brings us into His eternal domain. He adopts us into our fam His family. He could have simply cleared our names, but He goes one step further and He adopts us. He could have just stopped with adoption, but He goes one step further and commits to us. And He brings us into His eternal kingdom. That is the grace of God. And the grace of God is so profound that all people in the world, believers or unbelievers, to some extent experience the grace of God. That is what we call God's common grace. Think of what Jesus says in Matthew. Does God not make it rain on the wicked and the righteous? Does God not provide even for the wicked and the righteous? That is His common grace. But then God's special grace, His saving grace that flows from His common grace is then poured out on those who cling to Jesus so that they will escape the punishment that they deserve and get the immeasurable riches of God's grace. Quickly turn in your Bibles to Ephesians, and let's read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. And we'll read some passages from chapter 1 a bit later as well. Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Does it say you were sick? You just needed some medicine? A remedy? You were dead. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But, isn't that such a beautiful word? But God. But God being rich in mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses. Made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the, in the coming ages he, God, might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, 
which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Flowing from God's common grace that He pours out to the unrighteous, there is this special grace that is given to those who are in Christ Jesus, where they will now experience the riches of His mercy and the riches of His grace. This is the great gift of God towards those in the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father chose us in Jesus Christ. The most controversial doctrine in our day and age is probably the doctrine of election. Why? Because it makes God seem unfair, is what people say. You see, people think that the doctrine of election is this. All people are standing in a queue, and God's walking past them and saying, "Hmm, I want you, not you. I want you, not you. I want you, not you. But that is not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us that God stands before humanity and says, Here I am. And humanity sees God. Humanity loves the darkness rather than the light and kills one another as we trample one another as we run away from God, hating God, despising God because every thought and every intent of man's heart is continually evil. We are offended by the holiness of God. We run away. And as We trample one another running away from this holy God. He reaches out and grabs us and changes our hearts that we will come to love Him, come to desire what is good and precious and holy and right. People often think, well, if God only reaches out His hand, people will take it. Friend, did God not reach out His hand through Jesus Christ? Did they take it? Yes, they did, but they put a nail through it. We love the darkness rather than the light. And unless God changes us, unless God's saving grace works within us, we will always love the darkness rather than the light. This is what makes grace so amazing. That He who started a good work in us will bring it to completion. This is what makes grace so amazing. And so friends, I've really gotten to know so many of you over the last few months. But there's one thing that I always notice among the saints in Calvary. Is that many of you are living your lives thinking that God is merely tolerating you. Many of you go day to day thinking, God is actually disappointed in me, but I'm trying. That God is merely tolerating me. That He is frustrated with me. But friends, that is not the case. Just go one chapter back. Ephesians chapter 1. And listen to what the Apostle Paul writes. Ephesians chapter 1, and let's start from verse 3. Blessed, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of this world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself, as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He he has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. God chose you before the foundation of this world 
that He would come to know you and that you will come to know Him. Before you could have done anything wrong or anything right, God has determined to place His electing love and His gracious grace upon you. Friends, God knew every single sin you would do until the very moment before your death. And He still chose to save you. He is committed to you. He is not tolerating you. God is more committed to your salvation and to your sanctification than you could ever be. Before the foundation of the world, He was going to adopt you. In the difficult and the hard days, He is at work. Never to abandon us. Because listen to what Paul says in verse 8. His grace, the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us. Lavished. Ridiculous amounts of grace poured over us. Over the top grace. Oh, you need this much grace to be saved? Here's a whole ocean. Extravagant amount of grace. Way more than you could ever need amounts of grace. The riches of His grace which He lavished. Almost spoiled. Spoils us with grace. That is what He pours out on those who are in Christ Jesus. Man or woman that is struggling in Christ, God does not regret saving you. He knows who you are. He knew who you would be. And He knows how this is going to end. He is not tolerating you. He loves you. And He will, for the remainder of your existence, from this life to the next, pour out the riches of His grace, grace lavishly upon you. This is the God that we serve. This is what motivates you. This is what energizes you and what inspires you. And so what is the result then? Which brings us to our last study point. You cannot receive the grace of God and not be changed by it. Think of this analogy that I've used a few times already. If I were to step up to this stage tonight and I tell you the following. Just as I stepped outside of my house on my way to church, I got hit by a trash truck going 200 kilometers an hour. Full on collision. He hit me solidly. Not in my car, like on the, I was on the, side, the pavement and he hit me. Would you believe me? No. Why, why won't you believe me? Why is it obvious that I'm lying? Does it look like I was hit by a trash truck going 200 kilometers an hour? No. You would have seen some sign of that interaction. I want to ask you a question. What is bigger? Trash truck going 200 kilometers an hour or God? If someone claims that they have gotten in touch with God, gotten into contact with the Creator, it would look like it. If we are not transformed by grace, we have not been saved by grace. Because it is grace that changes. It is grace that transforms us. We often hear the following. Come to God just as you are. Friends, there is no greater truth. Come to God, come to Christ just as you are. But Christ loves you too much to leave you the way you are. His grace will change you. Where in justification, grace stands opposed to works, meaning you cannot work your way into heaven. It is the grace of God that justifies you. In sanctification, grace is the source of all your good works. Grace is the source of all your good works. 
and obedience. Martin Luther said, We are not saved because of our good works, but because we are saved, we will do good works. It is not the fruit that makes the root grow. It is the root, a healthy root, that produces healthy fruit. It is the grace of God that roots us, and the fruit will be evident as to how we now act out that grace of God. Those who God saves, He will never abandon. Those who God commits to, He is not just tolerating them. He loves them. He is satisfied with them. He rejoices over them. He will keep them forever. No one will take them from the hand of the Father. And so, when asked the question, what must I do to be right with God? The question is simply this. It's already been done for you. Jesus Christ lived the life that you could never live. And He died the death that you were supposed to die. Taking on the wrath of God in your place. But not just taking on the wrath of God, giving His life to you. Crediting His life into your account. This is the gift of God. God looks at you as of you because you are wearing the righteousness of Christ. God will never abandon His Son. If you are covered in the righteousness of His Son, He will never leave you nor forsake you. I hope this is a great message of encouragement and one that will make you realize that when we say God is love, we should be careful that familiarity with these terms and these doctrines do not help us to grow callous in our understanding and appreciation of them. And it is this love of God that we are to go to a broken world and share it with them. That God will not only not be angry with you, it is not only that He will not merely tolerate you, but that He will embrace you as His own Son. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, again we praise you for what you did through great men and women 500 plus years ago. Where they rediscovered these simple truths of the Bible. Lord, we are in this unbroken chain of those who are keeping to these truths. Lord, help us to accept difficult doctrines, not because we like them or loathe them, but because they are from you. Help us to not minimize or grow callous towards your grace. Forgive us where we think, Lord, that you are merely tolerating us. But like a father who loves a child, so you have committed yourself to us. Help us to live in this love and to live in this love towards one another as well. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Please stay for some coffee. I saw someone put out some sweets there on the table, so quickly run, grab them, um, and enjoy your week. Thank you.